Welcome to chapter 10. This is one of the big conceptual framework chapters and has some of the best supporting research around it. And it's also coincidentally one of my favorite areas of services marketing and we're dealing with the service scape. Now the service scape is the epitome of physical elements inside an absolutely intangible environment. And the service scape translates across a range of medium as well, so that you can actually have an online service scape. You can have a virtual service scape. For example, if you're playing World of Warcraft, the universe you are in is a virtual service scape. The software lobby login processes are an online service scape. The computer you're sitting at is a physical service scape. And if you happen to have um, an urge to dial for pizza and have the pizza delivered, your pizza goes through the urban service scape in order to get to you. So service scape scales beautifully. It can be done at a micro level, when we start looking at the service scape of a mobile phone, through to very macro levels, when we start thinking about the service scape of a city or the service scape of a country. So what this chapter is going to do is overview the way in which physical evidence operates in the service scape, the sorts of service scape environments, roles and protocols, why it's important to deal with service scape, and there's going to be a set of uh, elements that we'll touch on briefly in the video, but really you want to get into the depth and the detail of this, and one of those is the services service scape model. It is a complicated model insofar as there are a lot of moving parts, but it's also a very cohesive and coherent model so that the depth and the detail is something that you can get from a range of the articles that have tested it and examined it. So what we want to take out of this is why ServiceScape matters, how it impacts on the customer, and how it impacts on the employee. And since it impacts on the employee, therefore, why we should be designing service scapes with one eye to our staff and one eye to our customers' interaction. And lastly, what does the service scape do in terms of connecting product and promotion? So when we talk about service scape, we are basically bringing in the additional, one of the additional elements of the marketing mix and that's physical evidence. Within the service and the service delivery, most services will make use of some form of environment, some form of physical context. For example, even in recording this video, we have a physical service scape. So we actually have a service environment that is around me, which uh, is captured by the webcam, but also, when we are doing this, the service environment that you are watching this video in. Now, if you're watching it on a mobile device, handheld mobile device, you're in you know, the cafe, you've got the earphone in, you're watching it there, that is a different service environment to sitting in front of a computer screen. Now, as I'm recording this in front of a computer screen, I'm assuming that there's a computer screen available to you, there's you know, speakers, surround sound, the whole deal. But that's an assumption. You could be watching this on a bus on an iPad. You could be streaming this over um, Xbox on a TV set. There's a whole bunch of different service ways you could be encountering this. So as well as the technical elements, how you choose to engage with this video, the environment you choose to watch it in, impacts on its service delivery. So it's a really useful thing to be thinking about is how does the service, the physicality of a service, alter and adjust the way the service is encountered. So what are the component parts? What are the elements of the service scape? Now, in the service scape model itself, we have uh, a series of the ambient conditions, space, signs and artifacts, but we also have the internal person, the people's response, the way in which the staff member, the employee, their internal responses, 
and the customer, their internal responses. But if we step back to the physical elements and the physical elements for a moment, the couple of the key areas you're looking at are the exterior of a facility. So if you're looking at something like the ANU, if you take a lecture theatre as a service scape, the exterior of a service scape is the university campus, the university grounds. If you step one level back, you then look at the suburbs around the university. One step further back is the township or the city the university is based in. So the levels of exterior unpack. When we are looking at the exterior of a conventional facility, services facility, we are looking at aspects like parking, like signage. Can you find the entrance to the venue? Is that a feature? Is it hard to find the entrance because it's supposed to be the sort of place where if you have to ask, you don't know and you're not the right clientele? Is it somewhere you're supposed to be invited into by a friend so you are shown the way there? Is it something that's supposed to be obvious and overt so there's signage everywhere? So that's the outside. That's a design set of design decisions. And that should be considered both for branding and for service facilitation. What does the exterior of the building do to make a service promise? Once we step inside, we then have the interior. And that threshold, by the way, that first entrance, the door communicates a huge amount of expectation. You walk up to somewhere and those doors are carved and they are obviously hand carved and they are old. You are switching on a whole series of service promise expectations compared to electronic sliding doors or any other approach that you care to imagine will activate service expectation. The interior design, this is where you're also looking at the interplay with your service blueprint. This is a touch point. As a touch point, you need to make certain that it facilitates the delivery of the service. So your service design needs to facilitate the ability of your staff to deliver your service. This becomes really important when you start remembering that the staff will spend a lot longer in the service than the customer will. If we take something as basic as air travel, you'll be on a plane for an hour and a half. The flight attendants will be on the plane for most of the day. So you want to make certain that the facilities that you've set up, which can be tolerable if you're only there for 90 minutes, are not unbearable if you're there for eight hours. And this is where we come back to music, sound, and video. For the love of good service scape design, do not have short looping audio. Even if you know your customer is only going to be in the store for five minutes, if that video is on loop so that they will hear it twice in that five minute interval, then your staff are going to have really good grounds to get you to pay for all of their therapy about the nightmares they have from that music. It's also that, yes, you might have a very, your plan is to have a very short customer contact, so you want to be really strong impact, for example, walking into Lush. But if your staff has to have to breathe it for eight hours a day, five days a week, that's going to be problematic. That's going to be difficult for you to keep and retain staff if the service scape physical environment is oppressive to the staff member. Now the other element of service scape to bring in here, the other tangible elements of the physical. So here we're at physical evidence, we're at that extended part of the marketing mix. We are looking at things like integrated marketing communication. Business cards, stationery, billing statements, these are physical artifacts, physical representations of the brand and of the service. So they fit within and they need to be aligned with integrated marketing communication. Uniforms, employee dress codes, these again are linking back to the elements of people and these will link into when we talk about what is it we can expect an employee to wear as a uniform 
and maintain dignity in their emotional labor. And lastly, the virtual surface scapes, where we're dealing with the web, we're dealing with Twitter, we're dealing with mobile applications, we're dealing with social media. There are a series of virtual surface scapes that overlay physical environment, but they still now count as physical evidence because they are a way, they're a touch point where we interact with the brand. So what are the things that happen inside the service scape that make the customer experience and alter the customer experience? Now, one of the things I'll probably talk about in the class a lot is the flow state. There's a lot of really interesting work that's been done on flow state and flow state research itself is an amazing field to get into. But the flow is that loss of time. If you're in user interface design and user experience design, or if you've ever read a really good book, and you pick up a book, you start reading, you look at the clock, you go, okay, I'll, you know, and you set yourself a time in your head that you're going to stop. Next time you look at the clock, it is way past that. So if I just read for half an hour, it's four hours later, and you're three quarters of the way through the book. But it didn't feel like the passage of time. That's the flow state. A constant moving, a constant sense of motion and engagement and involvement. There's a lot of work around this, but one of the things I'll say about flow is flow has some really good consequences. Particularly if you can get flow state during during the design of a queue, it makes an amazingly significant difference to how happy people are when they get to the service. The other element, things that happen in the physical element and the physical evidence in terms of customer experience is we derive meaning from visual. And we'll take visual cues and the cue management. So we will look to start building up our expectations about the service by using the physical evidence that we can observe. So there'll be cue management. You can also find satisfaction in a service scape. And this is the thing to remember. Marketing is the creation, communication, delivery, and exchange of an offering that has value. Service scapes can be offerings that have value in and of themselves. They can be enjoyable places. They can be enjoyable environments. People can get a level of customer satisfaction from merely being inside a well-designed service scape. That in itself then becomes an additional part, an extended part of the product. So as with a lot of these parts, when we're looking at service scape, when we're looking at IMC, we should be thinking about them as a marketer. Service scape will impact as well when we talk later about the design of capacity management. Service scape and capacity management are heavily interlinked. And whilst we teach them as separate sections, you should see them as linked concepts. So the service scape here also will involve other people. So what do we do with the surface scape? Well, we should think of it first and foremost as the package for a service. Now, when you buy a new product and you start the unboxing process, that unboxing process is engaging the surface scape of the product. It's This is where we take out our Vargo and Lush embedded services. But uh, the surface scape basically communicates expectations, it influences perceptions. It is the package, the wrapping, and the first, and one of the strongest branding signals. The second level is that the service scape is there to facilitate the delivery of the service. It may be the service itself. For example, the service scape of buses, trains, and aircraft, boats, taxis, Uber hire cars, they are the facil facilitator of the service. Without this service scape, you can't have the service produced. But as well as facilitating the service, it can also do things such as teach. It can provide information as to how to act. It can facilitate an ordering process. 
and it can assist as well in linking customers with each other. So the socialization facet of the servicescape, particularly when we start talking about demand management, customer to customer interaction in venues, in crowds, in clubs, as audience, the servicescape can, can indicate whether you are supposed to collaborate with or separate from other customers. And finally, service scapes themselves can be a memorable point of reference. They can be a competitive advantage or a point of differentiation because they are visual experiences. They are one of the visceral, tangible experiences that will take place in the service. So they should be designed to maximize their value or maximize their role in creating value for the customer. All right, I briefly brought this, the Servicescape model up before, but really, Bitner 92 is one of the big impact articles of, well, of that particular decade. And I say this in a decade that gave us, the 90s to 2000s had some significant developments in services marketing thinking. And this is one of the big ones. So we look at what is the role here in terms of the service scape we perceive and the way the service scape facilitates both behavior and internal triggers and internal responses by the customer. So we're going to go into these component parts in detail on the way through. But it starts that we are basically looking at the service scape as a complicated variant on the stimulus organism response model. And in this, it's worth, if you're not familiar with uh, the SOR model, again, this is one where fire up Google Scholar, go have a look at what's been written about it, both the criticisms and its praise. But there's a fundamental descriptor of how, and again, think about this as a model in terms of explaining how the world works rather than predicting it mathematically. So within the service scale, what we look at are individual behaviors, social interactions, the responses, cognitive and emotive responses to service scape, and then what happens as modifiers. So effectively all service scapes play for one of two responses. You want an approach behavior or you want to create an avoidance behavior. Now an approach behavior is a positive coming to the service scape engage with the service scape. A negative behavior is do not stay, do not linger. An approach behavior is to have the restaurant, an avoidance behavior is to have the drive through. Avoidance behaviors can be used in service design to facilitate capacity management, to speed up and expedite consumption, acquisition, and departure. So if you have a high turnover rate and a high throughput of a service that's designed not to let people stay, that can be a good capacity management if that suits the service. Now, obviously what you don't want to do is switch your settings. You don't want to have a high approach rate if you are trying to get people through quickly. You don't want buses and trains so comfortable that people decide, you know what, I'll work from the public transport today. I've got free Wi-Fi, there's PowerPoint here, these seats are really comfortable. I'll stay on the train rather than getting off and going to work. Approach avoidance. They are both legitimate strategies to use and it's about knowing. And for your own service design, when do you want to apply them? The next factor to consider in the service scape is the social interaction. Now, social interactions work either as customer to employee or customer to customer. There is employee to employee. These tend to sit behind the screen, behind the lines of interaction on a service blueprint. But what you're looking at is social interaction is going to be impacted by the container, the service scape environment in which you interact. So 
Again, the details are in the text, but the one I want to emphasize here is scripting. Customer scripts and employee scripts. Employee scripts are strong uh, and they can be used in training. They can be, they fit within some of the stuff we're going to discuss about service role and service role conflict. But it's also possible to create customer scripts. You can teach customers appropriate responses. If you've been to a, a live show, there are things like known as callbacks. A response from the performers at a live show should trigger a response from the crowd. In the first couple of nights of doing this, you queue up, you basically invite your friends. So the performers bring in people, friends and allies they know and staff, put them in the audience, and the audience, the audience reacts gives the appropriate callback and then that builds up and the role of the partial or the hidden employee is to then train the customer to respond to the point that as new customers come in, older customers perform their script, perform their role and this builds up and enhances the service experience. All right, the so the next tier to this is that we've got the perceived service scape, we've got the conditions of the service scape, and then we've got what happens when an employee or a customer consumes the service scape and it then becomes a trigger for them to engage in cognitive and emotive responses and physical responses to the service scape. So in this, what we're looking at, again, what I want you to go back to the text, and I want you to really pay attention to in the text here is, how does this overlap with consumer behavior and with advertising? So cognitive responses, the what are the thoughts the consumer will get from engaging with my, with my service scape? What are the sort of emotive responses that they should expect? What are the emotive triggers that I am designing to create? And then when we think about emotive triggers, we're also thinking about what are the memories we are trying to create and store in the mind of the consumer. And lastly on this list is the physiological. And this is the one I come back to is employees will stay, will stay in service scapes for an extended period. So whilst you might want to design a high intensity service scape for the customer who will only experience it briefly, you will need to ensure that the high intensity, the high cognitive or emotive load that the service scape will trigger, that the staff member can exit that environment. That you are not requiring a staff member to take on excess cognitive or emotive load over time because they are going to be stuck in a high stimulus service scape. In terms of uh, responses to service scape, again this is a lot of consumer behavior theory underpinning this model. So we're looking at things like arousal levels. So a model that's designed for low arousal versus high arousal becomes very important here. Do we want, we need to understand our market segments and we need to understand whether the segment that we are targeting will want to engage in a service scape or want the service scape to be removed from them. Whether they're seeking the arousal, so a service scape full of shiny things that there's lots to explore, lots to engage with, versus an avoider who just wants a plain service scape that doesn't take up their cognitive and emotive uh, processing power. The other aspect we want to look at is the design of the service scape for the purpose. And this is where you look at a spectrum between the utilitarian and the hedonistic on one axis, and the business and the pleasure on the other axis. So you can actually have utilitarian pleasure. This is a very basic, very plain service scape, but the reason for being in this scape, service scape in this plain service scape is you want your focus on the service. The pleasure will come from the service. The pleasure, the business pleasure is basically also going to set the parameters in terms of are you here for work, are you here for fun. 
The final element that needs to be brought to attention here is that, as with consumer behaviour, temporary mood state is an important facet that we need to address and need to ensure that we are cognitive. of. The best service cape in the world is vulnerable to the consumer having had a bad day before arriving. Because there's not always a way in which your service cape can deal, but your service cape should not exacerbate poor temporary mood states. So the environmental dimensions, and pretty much this is the last of the big details. Ambient, spatial, symbolic. Now the ambient conditions impact on all five senses. Temperature, lighting, noise, all these can be designed to create specific sensory responses that are themselves designed to create an experience. Remembering that services marketing is experiential, these are your assets for really getting into deep into your product design and going, what is the experiential response I want my customer to have as a result of using my service? What of these triggers can I use to maximize the likelihood of them experiencing the service in the way we designed? So the service scape here does link back to a gap model in fact, links back to most of the gaps in the gaps model. And importantly, what I'd like to just pretty much close up on here is signs, symbols, and artifacts must connect to your integrated marketing communication. The labeling, the design, the user experience, the user interface, all of these facets are core parts of the service scape design but are also vitally important that they are consistent with your marketing communications so that the service scape is integrated into the overall communications and the overall message. Now this is the environmental dimension. This is an area we're going to talk about through examples and case studies, but it's also one where once you've read this chapter, it's really beholden on you to go out and now start consciously examining the service environments that you walk into. So this will, this particular, uh, the service scape model, it's very much, it's one of the most pragmatic and practically driven, example driven sections. So once you've watched the video, go out, go to a restaurant or a fast food outlet or go, go to a couple of them, compare and contrast, really bring along your thinking of what are the experiences that are being created here? What is the intention of the designer? What should we be engaging with? What are the cues? What is it like to be in this for a short period, for a long period? Really start unpacking the physical world around you. And it's a really, it also is one of the things about marketing being a living discipline, is that you can see it, consume it, and study it in real time, in real life. Now, as always, if you need any questions or queries on this content, at Stephen Dan or stephen.dan at anu.edu.au. It is a big area. It's a really, it's one of the big conceptual jumps. So it's well worth your time investing not just in reading the chapter, but in getting out there on Google Scholar and having a look at other articles in the area to see what's being done in terms of designing service scapes. And also from a consumer point of view, when you walk into a service scape, appreciating what's been done behind the scenes for you. Look at this go, oh, nice design. So that this should trigger this, I should have this sort of experience. Oh, good, good work, good design. And that's a wrap for this chapter.